Good morning and welcome to the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Legislative Caucus web meeting. I'm Lisa Hanairo with the Council of State Governments and I'll be managing the logistics for today's webinar. I want to welcome everyone today. This is the first quarterly web meeting for the caucus in 2019. We'll go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, this event is being recorded and the recording will be posted later today at the website you see on your screen. To reduce the noise on the phone lines, all participants are in listen-only mode right now, uh, but we will have time after each of the presentations for questions. You can either raise your hand um, with the hand icon in the webinar console, or you can type your question in the questions pane. If you do um, want to raise your hand and ask your question, you have to enter the audio pin that uh, is displayed in your um, audio settings. Otherwise, I won't be able to unmute your line. This is the agenda for today. We have two featured presentations and then we'll have a short business session afterwards uh, during which the members will hear about some of the caucus's recent and future activities. And now I'm going to turn it over to the chair of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Legislative Caucus, Senator Ed Charbonneau from Indiana. Senator Charbonneau. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you everyone who's on the uh the phone and participating in the webinar uh, meeting today. It's our first one of 2019, and and my uh, my first one as chair of the uh, Great Lakes Legislative Con Conference. Anybody that's unfamiliar with the organization, um, the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus is a binational, nonpartisan organization dedicated solely to educating engaging and serving state and provincial legislators from the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence region. Uh, clean water, we all know, is essential to support a healthy population, thriving economy, and a well-functioning ecosystem. Uh, so the caucus uh, we've organized around the guiding principle of assuring that the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence uh, Seaway provide a plentiful resource of clean, affordable water to the region's residents, businesses, and industries, both now and long into the future. Uh, we have, um, in, in hopefully the number will continue to grow, but uh, right around 200 legislators who are currently enrolled in the caucus uh, as members. And uh, I'd just like to remind everybody, um, membership isn't restricted to just legislators uh, within the Great Lakes Basin. Any legislators serving in the eight states and two provinces uh, are welcome to join the, the caucus. It's free and you'll get many benefits out of uh, participating, uh, I can assure you. Uh, I, I think as we go into 2019, this is an especially, especially exciting time for members of the caucus. Um, because uh, it, it's in the first full year of imp implementing the strategic plan, uh, which the executive committee developed in 2018. Uh, we'll be doing a lot more this year than in any previous year. And I, uh, I, I firmly believe we'll be offering something for everyone. Uh, uh, if any of the legislators on the line haven't enrolled as members, I. I would strongly encourage you to do so by visiting our website at greatlakeslegislators.org. That's greatlakeslegislators.org. Okay, uh, we, we only have an hour and we have a couple of great uh, presentations to go through, so let's move right into the, um, the, the featured topic today, which is effective measures to reduce exposure to lead in drinking water. Uh, the, the, the topic um, was the focus of our um, first pilot test of the concept for Great Lakes St. Lawrence Policy Institutes, which are sessions uh, where small groups of members get together and educate themselves on specific issues and then work together to develop a position statement, action plan, and elements uh, possibly of a model policy. Uh, for our pilot, we uh, selected lead in drinking water, uh, certainly not uh, because there's lead coming out of the Great Lakes, 
because there isn't. But uh, w we chose it because our highest priority is to assure the availability of safe, clean, affordable drinking water to our residents, uh, especially our most vulnerable population. Uh, to follow up on our pilot test, we organized a task force on lead, which has uh, been actively developing elements of a model policy, and we'll hear uh, more about that from Senator Rest um, during our business session. Uh, for our future presentations, we're extremely fortunate to have with us today Ms. Elizabeth B. Beardsley, I'm sorry, and Ms. Juliana Pino. Ms. Beardley is Senior Policy Council with the U.S. Green Building Council. She'll be speaking about the Council's report perspectives on state legislation, legislation concerning lead testing in school drinking water. After Ms. Beardley is done, Ms. Pino will share with us the results of Consensus Conference on Achieving Equity in Lead Poisoning Prevention Policy Making. Ms. Pino is the Policy Director for the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Um, uh, with, with that, I would uh, like to turn the floor over to uh, Ms. Beardsley, uh, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for that great introduction, and I really appreciate the invitation. We are very pleased to be here. Um, so today I will be talking about our report um, that we released in the fall on state legislation for school-led drinking water. I want to start with a very brief introduction to the U.S. Green Building Council. If you don't know our organization, we are a nonprofit, mission-based organization. We've just celebrated our 25th year, and we are dedicated to our mission to transform buildings, infrastructure, and communities to, to become supportive of both the planet and people. So we encompass environmental outcomes as well as health outcomes throughout all of our platforms. We are best known for our rating system lead, and this uh, system has become very successful and is used across the country in both the public and private sector to, to point as a tool to enable and recognize um, best-of-class strategies for reducing impact on the environment, as well as providing an indoor environmental quality that supports health of occupants, and we are continually reinvesting and upgrading, raising the bar in this system. So um, we currently have LEAD v4, and we've actually just released a draft of 4.1. So we are pushing it again farther, um, particularly with energy and, and climate considerations. Um, and we've also invested in a performance platform, um, which is ARC, and this is available free for any LEED certified projects. I want to mention that, as there's more and more attention to not only design and construction phase, but to make sure that buildings are operating at their intended level performance. And likewise, we are involved in scaling up the Sustainable Sites Initiative. Sites is a rating system for landscapes that is modeled after LEED, but it uh, uses a lot of green infrastructure and ecosystem services. So that's been really interesting to get involved in. Um, and we've been investing in resilience, and sort of a lot of what we've done has related to resilience, but we hadn't really talked about it that way. So we have developed a number of resources in the last few years that now talk the language of resilience and highlight specific strategies and ways to focus on resilience through um, use of our different tools. And being on the advocacy team myself, um, that's why I really wanted to highlight a few of those other areas that we're involved in, because we do want to be a resource to state legislators um, in any legislative ideas that you may have or questions. So please uh, do feel free to reach out anytime on, on any number of things. Okay, so with that, I want to jump in to the issue of lead in school drinking water. Um, as as um, the representative outlined, the uh, the problem is there that um, 
we know from the Flint experience being the most uh, visible and had the most news attention that unfortunately there is still an issue with lead in drinking water in some locations. What's most challenging about this problem is that it, it is not in the source water in general, but it comes from the plumbing. It can be the system piping from a public water system. It could be the solder. It can be plumbing in an individual building or even a fixture. And that's what makes the testing so critical to know if you really do have a lead exposure occurring or not. Um, there's not really a way to just uh, classify out whole buildings or even areas of a city um, based on characteristics. There might be higher and lower risks, but testing even to the individual outlet is really the only way to know for sure if lead is being leached into that water and therefore uh, consumed and exposures occurring. So the Government Accountability Office did a study um, a few years ago and looked at what was known about uh, lead in school drinking water and how much testing was going on. And at that time, what they found was that um, about 43% of school districts had reported testing, uh, about a similar amount, number had not tested, and 16% actually didn't know if they had tested or not. Um, from those that tested, about over a third had elevated lead based on what they believe to be an elevated level. And I'll talk more about that later in the presentation. So that shows that there's a large number of school districts as of the survey that had not done testing yet, possibly over half. Part of the reason for this is the way that we um, regulate drinking water um, in the U.S. So the EPA, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, regulates um, community water systems, which are those over with certain characteristics. And um, the challenge with lead and with copper is that there is no safe level. So um, the way that the EPA, the Safe Drinking Water Act, and the EPA's lead and copper rule approaches that is by taking representative samples in the system. And then if there is an elevated level over a certain threshold, then basically what happens is there's corrosion control studies and the drinking water system would adjust it, the chemistry of the water to make it less likely that lead would leach into the water. So it's, um, it's not necessarily getting that down to zero. So EPA does have a maximum contaminant level goal for lead of zero, but the action level to do that corrosion control change, to do that chemical change to the water, is 15 parts per million. And so it's just important to understand um, sort of how that, how that works out. And interestingly, with the um, testing requirements under the, the current lead and copper rule, there's an emphasis on residences of a certain age. So it's actually, if anything, it de-emphasizes schools in particular um, as a source for testing. Um, and the community systems have to report all of the testing and they, their statistics are based on that. So this has created a situation where schools may not be tested without some sort of intervention, whether that's a program, um, grant, regulation, or education, or a law. So we decided to take a look at, at state laws. So there have been some other programs um, run administratively, so where a state Department of Education or Department of Environmental Quality has decided this is a priority and went ahead and developed and implemented a program. Um, there's also been regulations that, that have been adopted in states, but because um, laws do have um, a unique role in ensuring compliance and may get more attention uh, as administrations change, they're more durable, um, we focused on laws in this particular study. So we found uh, about 16 state laws that specifically address the testing of lead in school drinking water. And most of these have all come about um, since the Flint episode, as shown on the timeline. Um, 
we looked at the different features and defined what we felt were the key measures of effectiveness or potential effectiveness of the state law. Um, most of these are fairly new, so ideally when we, we have done similar state law surveys in the past, we would like to see actual data that shows effectiveness, so, um, but with new laws, they, newer laws, they haven't all been fully implemented or reports developed on what happened as a result of the law. So we looked at four categories for effectiveness. First would be coverage. So are, is the law covering all the schools and all the susceptible population? Um, that's critical. Um, second, is it, does it ensure that testing will actually occur? So is it mandatory versus voluntary? Is it clear who's responsible? And how is there accountability and enforcement? Um, also, you know, the main goal really is risk reduction. So if there is lead in school drinking water, is, are there actions or is there a process to ensure that that risk is reduced? Um, and so there's a number of factors or features that are tied to that ultimate goal of risk reduction. And then lastly, um, we believe that a part of being effective is disclosure. Is that data available to parents? Is it available to teachers and staff at the school and to administrators um, who are responsible ultimately um, for that system? So those are the four ways that we looked at effectiveness. And then on the left column here are the features that we identified to distinguish some um, commonalities and differences across these 16 state laws. So um, financial burden, for example, was an interesting one. In many cases, there was no uh, specificity or um, provision for finance for who would pay for the testing. But in some cases, there, there was. So, um, and similarly, responsibility for testing. So we'll get into a couple of those as we go through the state. Um, I think the scope is one that's pretty important as some schools uh, limited the number the types of schools covered, some by the age of the buildings, some based on the grades that are taught, and some were public buildings and not private, which could have to do with authority and in the state or other factors. Um, and then some limited the number of outlets tested to just, so an outlet would be a drinking water fountain, um, a tap that's used in the kitchen or for drinking water or food, um, and uh, mm -hmm. some would, would be limited to just a couple of outlets or fixtures in the school. And what we know is that there's not, it's not that clear that you can know that, say, like a new outlet is necessarily going to be clean or an old outlet will have already flushed out all its lead. Um, so that's a factor to consider. Um, and then communication, as I mentioned, is really important. So mandatory versus voluntary, um, as you may imagine, um, the laws that are going to be more effective are those that require mandatory testing. And most of them do that. Um, a couple do not, providing funding instead as an inducement, but those in Colorado and Washington have seen a minority of schools conduct the testing um, as a result of that program. And it may be, you know, for schools to engage in testing of water, that's not their normal skill set, and it requires a lot of um, time to set up the program and to understand how to do it. So um, even if the actual testing cost is funded, that may not be enough to get schools to participate. Responsibility as well is um, is key. So most of them are putting the responsibility on the local school board, but a few put state agencies in charge, which can have benefits. And California actually charged the water systems themselves, and they would really have the most expertise um, to conduct the testing. Um, another key consideration is the action level. So most laws that are already on the books reference either the EPA's action level of 15 parts per billion. Again, that's based on a system-wide view, and that does not mean that 15 parts per billion at a drinking water fountain is safe. 
and that's, I think, been an unfortunate um, misunderstanding of what the action level represents. So, and EPA had previously put out a guidance that was out there for quite a long time that remediation was recommended if an outlet's lead level was 20 parts per billion or higher. However, um, EPA issued a new guidance just in October that stresses there is no safe level of lead and does not set a recommendation for when remediation should be conducted. Um, there are different recommendations out there. Washington, D.C. has the lowest and has set an action level of five parts per billion. Um, D.C. also has an interesting approach of proactively requiring filters on the drinking water fountains. And I think that's because of some history in the city with some elevated lead. So that's another approach as well, is to presume there could be a risk and to address it um, proactively. So some considerations um, for legislation would be to look at mandatory programs, um, ideally, with clear responsibilities that are appropriate in your state-specific context. So what agencies are strong? Where is the expertise? What is the typical relationship between school districts and, and these agencies? And you know, by giving thought to that can set up conditions for success. Certainly involving stakeholders and consulting with the agencies would be um, ideal. Um, we would recommend the scope should generally include all K-12 schools if possible, rather than trying to narrow it down. Um, and to consider testing as not only a one-off, but to be recurring. And uh, the data shows from these states that have implemented programs that in some cases, a school that tested clean might have another come back and something changed, and now there are some hits for lead. So it may be a scaled down testing is appropriate, but it um, does not mean if you test it once that then you could be assured sort of forevermore that there won't be lead. And again, that has to do with how plumbing fixtures are made and that water chemistry can change over time either intentionally from the water system or from the source. So there's all, a lot of variables there. And we would suggest state legislatures should be cautious in establishing an action level. As we've seen, like most of these laws fix that at 15, but now that's really not the right level to consider individual outlets and exposure. So uh, another approach would be to direct and empower state agencies to provide guidance on when a fixture or an outlet should be remediated or taken offline. Um, we've also seen that having remediation requirements or guidance is important and backing those with funding would likely be more effective. So I think that was the idea with California is that the water systems would do the testing but then the schools would need to do the remediation. So kind of thinking through like testing is a whole bunch of money there but then what do you do after that? And then um, I think with all, with all laws where you're trying to accomplish something, transparency, disclosure, and reporting are essential. And we've seen this repeatedly in our reports on different topics that having an agency report back to the legislature or to the public on how the law was implemented and the outcomes can be very effective in ensuring that it's properly carried out. Um, EPA has many tools. This is the new guidance that I mentioned that came out in October. The three T's is what it's called. And there's also a grant program now under the, the WIN program uh, that was passed last year. So let me stop there and if we have time for a couple questions. Yeah, I, I, Elizabeth, thank you very much for um, that presentation. We do have a few minutes and um, uh, I guess one thing I'd like to ask is that um, do you get into funding much um, or manner in which these projects might be funded? Um, somewhat, yeah. So I'm just pulled up. I think I'm still showing my screen, right? So this is the report. Um, the appendix has more details on each of the state laws. There's also some text in the report on each state. 
Okay. So funding here, some some don't have any provisions for funding specifically. Some have a grant program. Um, others uh, like DC authorized funding but didn't provide it. So there's really quite a range. Um, yeah. I don't. I guess. Um, let's see. This one in Illinois was kind of interesting. It it authorizes the water systems to pay for it, but then to charge schools. I think was how that one was set up. Is that right? Um, many of them did not necessarily provide. Either there were grant programs, or they didn't necessarily address funding. Yeah. It's kind of tend to be the trend. Yep. Okay, does anyone have any questions for Elizabeth? This is Lisa. I'll just remind everyone that you can raise your hand um, using the hand icon, um, or else you can type in a question. <clears throat> and we do have a question from Representative Robin Gable. Can uh, Elizabeth, would you please describe the new federal grant program that you mentioned? Sure. Um, let's see. There, uh, were funds set aside um, by the U.S. Congress, and that's now coming through through EPA. Um, I believe those are passed through, like to the states, and then they're intended to be distributed to schools to do testing. So that is being implemented in different rounds. So um, I will send the URL for the information page on the grant program, and you can see what stage they're at right now. Great, thank you. And I'll make sure that gets posted to the caucus's website. Um, I did have a question about, you mentioned that uh, typically when you do these types of multi-state surveys, you like to have data available to show effectiveness, but since these are new, that makes it uh, more difficult. Is there any plan to do a follow-up to this report once once there are some data available on, on how effective these measures have been? Um, I don't know. I think we have a, it would have to be a few years down the road, so um, I we can sort of put that in the hopper to consider and see if there remains interest and if there's um, still use for it. So I think, you know, our goal would be to do this kind of report when an issue is being you know, actively considered. So, um, if there are still states that are trying to figure out the best approach to addressing this problem and that a follow up um, appendix or something would be helpful, then, then yeah, I think we would consider that. Thank you. And then I don't see any other typed questions. I'll give people a few more minutes if they want to either raise their hand or type a question. But I, I wondered um, when you were looking at the different attributes. Did you find that, did you look at all at whether any of these states require testing of students in schools where elevated levels of lead have been found? No, that is a great question. We did not find that. And that would have been sort of like the penultimate, right, to see where the correlation was between, because um, really when you're testing the outlets, you're just testing for the possibility of exposure, and then there's, you know, how often the student's drinking, and how much does that accumulate, and is it, was that a blip, was that consistent? So, yeah, we did not see anything where people tried to correlate that with lead levels, uh, lead levels in children's blood. Students okay. Blood. Um, one, other, one other question. Um, have, have you talked about galvanized lines being replaced uh, along with lead lines? Um, we don't get into the drinking water system level um, interventions or or okay. approaches. So in this report, this okay. is really focused on testing in schools. All right. There are a lot of resources available from American Water Works Association, mm. and you probably have a state level, some state level water associations as well. Okay. And last one. Uh, all all K K twelve schools that include private schools. Do do you know? Um, so I some of them did. I believe some did apply to private schools. Um, let's go down uh, back to that table. Um, 
I mean, if you think about it, if the goal is to protect children, mm -hmm. um, then why would there be that distinction? Um, especially if funding's not required. So if, if funding's required, I mean, funding's provided, there could be well be a policy reason to limit that to public schools. But if it's a health-based mandate or a safety concern, then I'm not sure. So here's New Hampshire included private schools, for example. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I also I had scrolled up because there were a couple states that had some reports already from the early program. Find it. Um, where did it go? Uh, yeah, Colorado did have a report that was a voluntary program, and <clears throat> there wasn't much. I'm sorry, Elizabeth, I, I started oh, to bring up Juliana's slide. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, so there's there were a couple states that had reports. Colorado really just was about showing how many schools had taken up the funding, had, which was pretty small. And then New York had a, a more involved report. They had one of the first laws in 2016 and had extensive testing. Um, and then um, actually, I think it was the NRDC did a study evaluating that data as well. So this couple pages goes into what the New York City uh, report, sorry, okay. the New York State and Cities experience. So yeah, I mean, invite you to look through it and please um, don't hesitate to ask. If you have any further questions, feel free to contact me directly. Great. Elizabeth, thank you very much for your time and, and the great presentation. Um, now we will uh, move on to a, a presentation on achieving equity in lead poisoning prevention policy making um, by uh, Juliana Pino. And as I indicated uh, earlier, um, uh, Ms. Pino is the policy director for the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. So Juliana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for spending some time with us today discussing lead poisoning prevention. My presentation will focus on achieving equity in lead poisoning prevention policy making, and I'll be reviewing proceedings from a consensus conference that was held in August of last year that produced these recommendations. Next slide. quick overview, I'll be going over the proceedings very briefly. I'll be highlighting the overarching identified impacts across all of the policy areas we considered with lead poisoning prevention. Then I'll do a deeper dive into the specifics around equity impacts and recommendations for lead poisoning prevention in schools and child care facilities. Next slide. So one thing I wanted to highlight, I'll be your speaker today and I work at a community-based nonprofit that works at, at the national, local, state scale around many different kinds of environmental justice policies, the intersection of environmental policy and um, disproportionate impacts that often fall on low-income communities and communities of color. But today's content was contributed by a group of 40 national experts who convened at the consensus conference I mentioned in August of 2018 and contributed these ideas. These experts ranged from community leaders um, dealing with lead in water issues right at the source in communities across the country, all the way to the National Water Associations, all the way to um, environmental policymakers, all working on this issue from different perspectives, trying to come together to understand if we analyze the policy proposals and policies that are being passed, how do we understand how they actually impact communities? Next slide. So accessing the report can be found on the Human Impact Partners websites. They are the authors of the report. They summed up the proceedings. And additional resources can also be found on the Joyce Foundation website. Um, and I included the URLs here for your accessing them in the future. Much more detailed information is available there. Next slide. So a quick project background here. The need for this arose out of the, uh, the urgency around enacting lead prevention policies. 
and the way that urgency was driving implementation of policies that weren't necessarily accounting for unintended consequences for the communities the policies were intended to serve. And that was the, the context in which we came together for this conference. Next slide. Some of the goals here were to explore the extent to which policymakers were implementing these policies and considering those equity impacts, and then to make specific recommendations to improve those considerations in communities. And the thought here was that in connecting all of the different aspects of implementing these policies, we would be able to have a generative dialogue and really identify what does this look like in the real world? How do these policies behave? when they're actually being implemented and what might be anticipated in advance as we're choosing between different policy options. Next slide. So this is a little bit more about the consensus conference approach. It has to do with professional facilitation, a lot of um, structured deliberation, working through some questions. Next slide. We used an equity analysis tool at the conference, and this emphasized equity in two different lenses, equity as a process and as an outcome. We looked at who is affected and how they were affected, and then we identified concrete actions to limit or, to limit or mitigate those impacts. Next slide. So quickly, this is important to understand how these policies behave in the real world. Equity as an outcome, is achieved when identity no longer systematically exposes people to risks or grants people privileges with regard to socioeconomic and life outcomes, and when people who need the most are prioritized to receive the resources required to thrive. Many of you may have heard, your zip code shouldn't determine your life course, or where you live shouldn't have bearing on whether you survive. Equity as an outcome really speaks to that. Equity is a process. We achieve equity when those most impacted by historic and current structural biases and injustices are leading or meaningfully engaged in efforts to prioritize issues, to craft and implement solutions, and to develop accountability measures and monitor progress. This focuses on the procedural justice with how policies are made. Equity outcomes are more achievable when communities themselves are directing and are involved in the decision making around the policies that they will be living with. And what we found as an overarching um, conclusion was that really including both was critical to ensure that the locational differences were accounted for, that community differences were accounted for in coming up with the appropriate policies. Next slide. We prioritized three different areas of policy. We looked at residential lead service line replacement, lead testing in water and schools at, and daycare facilities, child care facilities, and testing and remediations of lead-based paint hazards and housing. This presentation will focus on number two. Next slide. Now to dive into the recommendations and impacts. Next slide. The overarching high level impacts across all of the different areas included exacerbated inequities and mistrust resulting from poor community engagement. This has to do with equity as a process. In many jurisdictions, what we saw was there were well-intentioned decision makers and environmental policy advocates and others who were making decisions, but they were making them in a vacuum. Communities weren't being brought in early enough into the process and were receiving the policies at the end. This was creating um, additional barriers to actually implementing the policies such that they were protective of human health. The second impact, fragmented lead policy frameworks. The difficulties here associated with the patchwork of laws, regulations, and financing frameworks, some of what Elizabeth was talking about, really lead to a siloed programmatic approach. So piecemeal strategies and a climate of competition across different sources of lead and the settings in which it can be found can really, really hamper the effectiveness of programs. And it also really spreads out resources thin. So in, in your work, if you're thinking about how to address this issue, really bringing in the different ways in which people are working on the same um, contaminant into the same conversations can really help with this impact. 
The fourth was the disproportionate cost of unfunded remediation. So communities that are already struggling financially can be further impacted when then they're required to bear the cost of implementing lead prevention policies. If communities are unable to remediate exposure, people continue to experience health impacts, but then they also have the added cost of trying to meet those requirements when they can't afford it. So the financing becomes very important when it has to do with impacts in communities that are already experiencing poverty. The last was unfair stigmatization. Parents and families, especially black mothers, are implicitly and explicitly blamed in policy discussions about preventing exposure of children to lead. There are assumptions about their housekeeping, parenting, or choices about where they live. And when children from these communities are labeled as lead poisoned, that can both create access to, to healthcare opportunities and exacerbate stereotypes or convey that these children are irreparably damaged. So the way that we talk about the policies also has consequences. Next slide, please. In terms of recommendations, so the first recommendation was really speaking to the equity as a process. So ensuring meaningful community engagement and prioritizing community needs and decision making. The second was taking pains to implement a holistic lead reme remediation framework. This would look at multiple sources of lead simultaneously, employ permanent remediation methods, and would really um, be efficient in terms of how expertise in your state is combined to deliver the most effective programs. The third recommendation is can be tailored regionally, statewide, or nationally, but this is really about awareness, elevating the need to, to have folks understand why comprehensive lead exposure and reduction compels policy action. This is helped with the second recommendation. If you have experts from multiple lead areas working together, this can help communicate the the depth of the issue to the public and to people who are impacted the most. And the fourth is to really prioritize funding for lead remediation and prevention programs based on the communities that need it most. So this is looking at the scope of communities in the state where you're working and saying, how do we understand who's already most impacted and how do we make sure to target our funding to those communities so that they're not going to be additionally burdened? Next slide, please. Specific to the child care and drinking water in schools, these are some of the impacts and recommendations from the report. Next slide. Three key impacts here to consider. Insufficient testing protocols can create more problems. What did we see here was that, you know, the, no, the lacking of the federal requirement for lead testing or disclosure in schools, if and how lead is detected, um, all of that varies and testing protocols are inconsistently applied. Mitigation thresholds and strategies differ. Disclosure requirements are often unclear. All of this makes it difficult to monitor whether issues are being adequately addressed and this can also create a false sense of security among families who are often unaware of the risk. You know, we, we see here because of the lack of clarity around the protocol, sometimes schools are providing reassuring but unsubstantiated language about water quality based on limited data. Combine that with some inadequate disclosure and it can create a false sense of security or complacency to address the problem because the communication isn't necessarily accurate to what's happening. Also, policies focused only on lead and water and disclosure only related to that can also mean families, staff, people are often unaware of the other risks of lead exposure that um, may be present in facilities, including in paint and soil and toys and the difficulty of a, a lacking of standard testing protocols also means that understanding what the protocols are can be limited by staff and other people who could otherwise answer questions. The second impact really focuses on the enormous financial challenges. This really has to do with, you know, a lot of times, and as we see in some of the scans, like the one that Elizabeth shared, um, the funding is inconsistent and the situations really vary by school district. You know, what we've seen are that affluent schools are more likely to replace old plumbing. Schools in poorer districts simply turn the water off. And this creates different problems. Without potable water, children are more likely to consume sweetened beverages. That also exacerbates other health mm -hmm. consequences. 
Many schools are responsible for covering their own costs, which poses significant barriers to entities that have limited financial resources. And as many of you know, these schools are often struggling with basic maintenance expenses. Furthermore, when schools can't, can't afford to install filters or provide bottled water, um, again, they resort to closing taps. So families must find a way then to provide ch the water children need for the day. So one, one thing that we also see here is that there's a trend of foundations funding filters, but this is not necessarily a sustainable strategy and can also result in lower profile, low income areas getting no assistance. The third impact is around children falling through the cracks. This has to do with gaps in drinking water testing and remediation policies that can leave certain groups of children vulnerable to lead exposure. Again, certain policies for water testing in schools and daycares are generally restricted to specific categories of facilities. Where they exist, most school testing policies require only public schools, for example. That means children at private schools or unlicensed facilities are not covered. Low-income children are more likely to face lead exposure at home as well, and there are gaps in testing that can increase their risk. Other facilities are not covered include urban park districts, community centers. These are also a source of lead exposure and also places that children spend a lot of time. Next slide. <laughs> So I went through these in detail, but I wanted to leave these in the presentation for use in posterity. So this again is in, in summary of the insufficient testing protocols. The next three slides will we'll cover the details. Next slide. Thank you. On to the recommendations. So here there's some really clear recommendations around providing financial resources to schools that that really, you can't, you can't avoid this one. It's really difficult. There was already uh, the question raised earlier in the presentation. This is one of the more challenging aspects of this kind of policy making, but really requires policymakers to be as creative as possible to think through how funding, in particular to areas that are under duress, can facilitate the kinds of programs people are attempting to implement to actually happen. This is really important. There are many different ways that this has happened. There are schools that have been able to use infrastructure funds um, to cover some of their lead remediation costs. There have been, um, you know, looks at state grant programs that would normally be going to different kinds of infrastructure but could be used for these kinds of um, smaller implementation in school districts, but that requires some changes to the law around those existing programs. In other areas, they've been able to think about health and safety funds through public health departments. So this is really a call to be as creative as possible to think through what are the different kinds of opportunities to fund these programs in your state and how might your state's jurisdiction have structures that maybe not be used this, for this traditionally, but could be if, if laws were changed. The second recommendation um, has to do with improving and standardizing testing and disclosure requirements. And the third has to do with targeting and prevention and remediation efforts at all places where children engage. Next slide. We'll go into these in a little more detail. So again, this really um, calls on the need for support around financial resources. And I just want to reiterate, creativity is really needed and there have been some, some great solutions. So this is a place where talking with your fellow legislators can really be helpful to think through, how did you solve this in your jurisdiction? What are you still being challenged by? Next slide. In terms of improving and standardizing testing and disclosure requirements, I want to echo what Elizabeth said about how difficult it is and to proceed with caution in terms of setting an action level. Um, again, there's no safe level that has been conclusively defined, but there are other parts of testing and disclosure requirements that can be addressed directly. Certainly required testing at schools and child care sites should occur routinely and on a schedule that is publicly communicated. Protocols should ensure that tests demonstrate a tap is safe for drinking. Um, there have been some cases where there's been inconsistent testing protocols that don't really 
establish this, which is should be a clear result of what you want to see from a protocol, but is not necessarily always included. Following testing, schools and child care facilities should disclose results and remediation plans, both in a timely fashion and in a way that it's informative and clear for parents. What we're seeing is there's been communication in some jurisdictions around the testing when it's happening, but it's really difficult for, to understand for a person who's not an expert in this. And most people are not experts in this. And so if the information is being communicated, but it's not understandable, that's clearly a problem. This is the same challenge as making sure that all the information that decision makers are working with is understandable. And one of the things we see here is with sometimes this can be very uh, technical in a way that's not necessarily helpful for parents to actually take action. Again, in the absence of reliable test results, Direct mitigation is important in terms of schools and child care facilities providing filtered water stations and refillable bottles, but those policies also require financial support. So this really should be done in tandem with recommendation one, such that the schools aren't made to provide these without support in meeting the recommendation. Next slide. And this Third recommendation focuses on targeting prevention. If, you're, if your state has started with child care facilities and daycare facilities, look for those opportunities to protect young people wherever they are. And this includes how can you reach those unlicensed facilities that are smaller? How might you create testing programs that focus on household daycares, for example, which can be very common in many communities, um, families that take care of other families three children, four children, five children at a time. There's, those are the kinds of programs that, um, that really take the prevention further as it, as it should be to deliver the most protection. And parks and community facilities. We see um, a lot, a lot of communities where these parks and community facilities are the places where many families are spending their time. And so essentially you have situations where children are spending time at home and then also spending time at these facilities and also spending time at school. And if you're not thinking about prevention that's both residential and about the school and about the park, they might be protected in one context, but then might be very exposed in another. Um, so this really has to do with what are the additional policies that you can pursue that think through mitigation and testing and prevention at these other sites. Um, public water fountains are another really good example of ones that aren't necessarily tied to these kinds of facilities, but maybe are standalone that exists in some jurisdictions. So really think through, if you are going through the course of a day, what, what are the places that people might be accessing water and particularly children accessing that water that aren't necessarily tied to where we might be traditionally thinking about their maximum exposure. Next slide. And that, that's, that's it in summary. There are, a, again, a lot of additional details here and the report really provides a great walkthrough of many different aspects of each of the recommendations and impacts. I gave you the highest level summary, but I'm very happy to have joined today and want to welcome any questions with the minutes that we have left. So thank you very much, Juliana, for that uh, great presentation. Um, we have time for maybe, maybe one question one, one. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, uh, Juliana. You, you, you mentioned your your meeting was in Chicago, I, and as you went through everything, I couldn't help but think about East Chicago, Indiana, and I would anticipate that that came up in your discussions quite a bit. Yes, it certainly did, in particular because East Chicago is in a situation where they're experiencing lead exposure from a particular industrial actor as well as in their drinking water infrastructure. So they're really dealing with multiple pathways of exposure, which requires um, a comprehensive approach that doesn't prioritize one over the other, but really treats them all with urgency. And that's what the community has been asking for. Yeah. Juliana, okay. we do. this is Lisa. We do have a question um, from Elizabeth Caesar at the Joyce Foundation, and this actually relates to um, what the caucus is doing with the task force on lead. Do you have a recommendation um, for supporting schools that serve a student community where some parents speak English as a second language? So this relates to the um, disclosure. 
Yes, so we would recommend that being thoughtful around disclosure notices that are responsive to the cultural context of the community where programs and policies are being implemented is the right thing to do. In Illinois, we started with mandating that, um, and this has to do with lead service lines, but we started mandating that notices be posted in a number of different languages because we have, especially in the Chicago metropolitan area, so many different communities that they may be getting the notices, but it's a different way that the information is unintelligible if it's in a language that parents aren't using. Um, ideally, you would have requirements that would be responsive to communities and the sort of less ideal but better than nothing policy would be to require a, a sort of subset of languages that are most common and, um, and to have those be baked into statutes so that it's not optional that those notices be provided in a way that's understandable. The other things that we would suggest are for regulatory bodies to have points of contact who can engage in the language um, that the community needs to access the information in so that they can also be answering questions and be present at community meetings um, and directly engage with households, school staff, and other decision makers to implement the programs locally. Uh, now, we've seen cases where, for example, cities have provided lead testing kits for residential areas um, or other resources, but they've been highly underutilized by the subsets of communities that are both under economic and social duress and don't speak English as a primary language. Um, so then the, the program ends up not being implemented wholesale in those community areas, and that's a very inequitable outcome. Okay, great. Um, we do have, we have one more question. Um, I'm, I'm going to read it and then Juliana, I'll ask you if you could follow up in uh, an email message to me and I'll make sure it gets to um, Representative Rachel Hood. Could you expound on some of the impacts following the distribution of filters? Why aren't those programs working? And I'll also ask any other attendees, if you do have questions for either speaker, please put them in the uh, questions pane or email them to me and I'll make sure they get to the speakers and we get an answer for you. But in the interest of time, Senator Charbonneau, I think we should move on to the business session. Yeah, Juliana and Elizabeth, thank you so much for your um, presentations. You're certainly welcome to stay on with us as we uh, conduct a short uh, business session. But uh, if you don't have interest, you're welcome to, uh, to leave us at this point. But thank you again. Um, let's move to the, the uh, uh, business session and we talked earlier a, sh a little bit about the task force on lead that had been put together and working very uh, diligently and we have uh, Minnesota Senator Ann Rest who's past chair of the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus to give us a report. Senator Rest. <clears throat> well thank you um, Senator Charbonneau. I, I have one uh, comment ahead of that and the uh, Department of Health in Minnesota just yesterday released a uh, study that they had done on uh, lead service lines in Minnesota indicating that it would cost four billion, that's with a B, dollars to get lead out of the water in Minnesota. Um, but the estimated benefits from that removal um, range up to $8.5 billion. So we know it is a, um, you know, states across the country are very concerned about it. But with regard to our um, task force, we have um, been working on the specific uh, issue of preventing exposure to lead in drinking water, even though we know it occurs elsewhere as well. Um, most of our members participated in last year's um, pilot Great Lakes St. Lawrence uh, Policy Institute and many of our jurisdictions are already taking steps to address this problem. Certainly Minnesota has. Our approaches vary and we believe that tweaking some of our current policies would indeed benefit public health. The work that the Task Force is doing will help us over the long term to implement consistent science-based measures to better protect our citizens, particularly our most vulnerable populations like children, pregnant women, low-income families. We have two members um, from uh, Michigan now, uh, Senator Curtis Banfall, who is an executive committee member, and Representative Leslie Love. 
Also, Assemblyman Sean Ryan from New York has joined. So each of the states now has representations. We have developed elements of uh, a model policy. We've had two conference calls. We hope to um, complete our recommendation for model, model policies. We had hoped to do that by the end of January, but it was too ambitious, and now we're working on a more reasonable date in March. We have been educating legislators, um, <clears throat> understanding that as an important part of the caucus's in today's to today's web meeting, our activities will include a session at our upcoming annual meeting, and a, and a, breast, a breakfast, excuse me, table topic session at the annual meeting of the Midwestern Legislative Conference in July. Both of those, of course, are in Chicago. We'll hold a workshop in September in Chicago to assess our progress and to move into phase two during which we'll try to take on the challenge of funding the full replacement of lead service lines. We really want to thank the Joyce Foundation for funding our pilot test and helping us to fund, uh, to focus on lead in drinking water in 2018 and 2019. And these activities would just not have been possible were it not for the financial support we receive from the Joyce Foundation. We also want to thank Elizabeth Caesar, the Senior Program Manager at the Joyce Foundation, for her very helpful advice and guidance in identifying speakers and, um, and other resources. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you, Senator Rest. Are there any questions, comments? Very good. Thank you. We will now move to item B on the business session uh, executive correspondence and last Friday uh, the executive committee submitted uh, comments on the uh, the Army Corps of Engineers plan for in implementing measures to stop Asian carp from invading uh, Lake Michigan uh, this letter was the fourth one that we've submitted with regard to the Corps Great Lakes Mississippi River interbasin study uh, our been consistent uh, over the years uh, that the, the, the Corps should implement a uh, cost-effective, affordable solution, involve the states and provinces and their legislators in this decision-making and act with um, urgency. Um, you'll find that letter, uh, I, I do believe, on the uh, uh, Great Lakes Legislative website. And in addition, we will, the, the executive committee will shortly be sending to the congressional delegations, a letter of support for the uh, uh, the Great Lakes uh, Restoration in Initiative, and this letter has been a, become an annual tradition for us. To um, uh, since it's so vital for the uh, federal funding to be available for the projects, um, and thirdly, uh, new this year, and it's something that, that I'm very excited about. We'll be joining the Great Lakes uh, Commission and several other organizations and issuing joint priorities for the Great Lakes region in 2019. Um, talked about this in the past, and I, I think it's a really great step forward for the for our caucus. Um, the, we'll see these priorities released next week and announced on Twitter. Um, I didn't know they were on Twitter, but uh, if you're on Twitter, I encourage you to follow the caucus at GLL Caucus. And finally, we'll move to the last item, uh, talking about uh, the preview of 2019 event. And uh, Lisa, can you give us a quick update on that? Sure. Thanks, Senator Charbonneau. Um, well, coming up next week on March 6th and 7th, Senator Rest and Representative Kurt Sunny and I will be in Washington, D.C. This is the first time that the caucus is going to be 
um, participating in any of the Great Lakes Day events that take place uh, every every year in DC. Um, we'll be attending the meeting of the Great Lakes Commission Board um, and uh, also conducting some GLLC business while we're in town. Um, and, and this is connected with the priority statement that Senator Charbonneau mentioned. Uh, looking ahead to the next quarterly web meetings, we have them scheduled for June 7th, September 6th, and December 6th at 9 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Eastern. The June 7th edition is the annual review of federal, state, and provincial legislation. Uh, so I hope you'll all be able to attend. Registration for the web meetings always opens one month in advance. So watch for that in May. The caucus, of course, is going to hold its 2019 annual meeting in Chicago on September 13th and 14th. Registration for members of the caucus will open June 1st. And moving on, uh, much later this year, uh, probably late October, early November, will be the first Patricia Burkholz Institute for Great Lakes St. Lawrence Policy. That event will take place in Michigan. For those of you who don't know, uh, the late Michigan Senator Patricia Burkholz, or Patty, uh, was the, the founder of the caucus back in uh, 2003. The focus for this year's Policy Institute, uh, Burkholz Institute, will be nutrient pollution. And I want to thank the Fred A. and Barbara M. Herb Family Foundation for uh, providing support that makes this event possible. And then finally, as early as next week, I hope to be transmitting to all the members um, the product of the caucus's task force on uh, Great Lakes St. Lawrence Appreciation Day. There's a recommendation that will be going to the executive committee later today for approval. Um, and uh, assuming the, the executive committee members approve, and I think they will, since this was at their direction in the first place, um, the members will have an opportunity to uh, uh, sign on to a resolution in each of the jurisdictions that would establish uh, a single day this year as Great Lakes St. Lawrence Appreciation Day. So watch for that. Thank you, Lisa, uh, for the update. There's a lot going on for sure. Uh, anyone have any questions, comments before we adjourn? You're hearing none. I, I again want to thank everyone for participating. Uh, these are uh, very informative, very helpful for us as we move forward. We have a lot going on, and thank you for your participation. We are adjourned.